Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Why don't you go to church? The priest asked the man with whom he had struck up a conversation in the grocery line. All I have are my work clothes, the man replied, looking down at his dusty jeans, his muddy boots, and his sweat-stained t-shirt. I can't come to church looking like this. So, over the next few days, the priest collected some nice clothes from the men in his congregation and happily presented the man with quite an upgrade to his wardrobe. One sunny day, several weeks later, while walking down the sidewalk, the priest happened to bump into the man again, who now sported a pair of khaki slacks and penny loafers and a white cotton short sleeve button-down shirt. Why didn't I see you at church? The priest asked. It's like this, the man confessed. Last Sunday, I showered and shaved and put on some of the new clothes you gave me. Well, I look so darn good that I decided to go golfing instead. Jesus' parable of the great banquet, today's gospel lesson from St. Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 24, was told at a dinner that Jesus attended at a Pharisee's house. In the first part of chapter 14, St. Luke tells us that Jesus heals a man with dropsy or severe abdominal swelling, and then he teaches a brief lesson on serving others, promising in verse 14, the verse immediately preceding today's gospel lesson, that those who serve others will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. At the mention of the resurrection, someone reclining at the table with Jesus says in verse 15, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. In reply, Jesus tells the parable of the great banquet, wherein a certain man planned a large banquet and sent out many invitations. In verses 16 and 17, we read that when the banquet was ready, the man sent his servant to contact each of the invited guests, telling them that all was ready and that the meal was about to start. But they all began making excuses. Not one, not two, not three either, but all of them. One man explained in verse 18 that he just bought some property and that he needed to go check it out. Another man said in verse 19 that he just purchased 10 oxen and that he was on his way to yoke them up and try them out. And yet another man gave the excuse in verse 20 that he was newly married and therefore could not possibly come. Now, all of them were quite polite in their refusal, saying, please excuse me. However, when all was said and done, they had all rejected the very generous offer of the host. Consequently, when the master of the house heard these flimsy excuses, he was angry. And so he told his servant in verse 21 to forget the invited guest list and to go into the city and to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Note, it was not into the homes, but into the back alleys and into the run-down places that the servant was sent to find these people and to bring them into the banquet. And so, obediently, the servant brought in all the down and out townspeople he could find. Even so, the servant reported back to the master that there was still more room in the banquet hall. Whereupon the master told the servant in verses 22 and 23 to go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. Jesus ended his parable by telling his hearers in verse 24, the master's determination that not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, on the surface, it appears to be a very open-hearted, compassionate, warm and fuzzy type parable. However, as we've seen before, Jesus' parables aren't necessarily known for being warm and fuzzy. Rather, Jesus' parables 
tend to have a bite to them. And this one is no exception in its utter rejection of the first invited who literally turn their backs on the master of the house. The statement that prompted the telling of the parable in the first place is key. The man who in verse 15 looked forward to dining in the messianic kingdom of God probably subscribed to the then popular notion that only the Jews would be part of that kingdom. Thus, the parable Jesus told was aimed at debunking that rather misguided notion. So, bearing this in mind, let's take the next few minutes to look at the parable on several different levels. In the first place, there are the players. We can see God the Father as the master of the house, preparing the world and all eternity for the appreciation of and enjoyment of all his children. Moreover, Almighty God, as the Master, chooses to make a covenant not only with the Jewish people, but also with all who would become believers, that is, all true Christians, and that all are invited into his glorious banquet, better known as the kingdom of God, or more simply, heaven. And then there is the faithful servant who goes out who is initially Jesus himself and is later to be emulated by those who call themselves disciples of Jesus Christ. Again, that is all true Christians who are called to take the word of God, the invitation, if you will, out into the world and to share it with others. And like the parable of the sower in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 23, wherein Jesus speaks about four different kinds of soil, there are similarly several different layers of people who accept or deny the Master's gracious invitation. Secondly, there are the excuses. Man, oh man, are there ever excuses. The first is about possessions. I have purchased some land. The second is about work. I have purchased 10 oxen to help me work better. The third is about relationships. I have gotten married. Now, I have to ask how many times have those kinds of excuses prevented any of us from coming to church or having a quiet time of prayer with just God or reading or studying the Bible or reaching out to someone else with the good news of Jesus Christ or supporting the church either financially or in terms of our God-given spiritual gifts of service. Possessions, work, relationships. These are the timeless excuses, aren't they? In fact, they are the ways through which we have come to explain our lives. Let me repeat that. They are the ways through which we have come to explain our lives. In other words, we're much too fill in the blank to respond to God's call. And so it's okay that we don't because we have all these handy, timeless excuses. Family in town? Better skip church. Work too hard at the office last week? Better play golf on Sunday morning. Did too much house or yard chores? Best to hit the couch and binge watch Netflix rather than spend time reading the Bible or praying. Deserving of that new foreign car or large mansion or expensive jewelry or that southern vacation? Don't worry about giving to the work of the church. We continually excuse ourselves and Pretty soon we come to believe that the excuses are more important than the thing we once knew with certainty was important. Consequently, we end up devaluing the banquet and focusing instead on the effort of making our excuses. Thirdly, the master of the banquet tells his servant to compel them to come in. In other words, God doesn't give up just because the initial invitees all have their excuses. Almighty God isn't about to say, well, okay, I didn't get their attention, so I guess I'll just let this one slide. No, God just keeps on relentlessly seeking and inviting. Accordingly, God is still very much in the business of proactively searching for the least 
and the last and the lost. And in so doing, he models what he expects his followers to do. God fully expects that those who have been ostracized and left alone and who count themselves among the never invited camp will need to be convinced. Consequently, God sends out his faithful servants to make it all happen. Fourthly, the people who are eventually brought into the banquet are the least and the last and the lost. They are, in short, the uninvited. As I alluded to a, a few moments ago, at the beginning of St. Luke's chapter 14, we read that Jesus was invited to a banquet in a Pharisee's house. Now, the Pharisees like to, in effect, sit around in big back rubbing sessions where they glad handed each other and talked about how wonderful they all were. And they loved to argue about which one of them was the most important. Hence, this parable was Jesus' reframing of what a true banquet in God's eyes should really look like. Basically, Jesus told the host of this particular dinner to invite in people who couldn't possibly return the favor. Now, we're all familiar with the attitude that goes, you invited me to your party, so I'll invite you to mine. Well, Jesus said that they should invite in the people who would never get to experience a party without their generous invitation. Thus, Jesus was telling his listeners then, and he is telling us now, that God expects a different kind of hospitality to be offered to others by those who claim to be his people, because that was the very kind of hospitality that God offered. God who created a world and made it good for all his children to enjoy. God who made a covenant with his own creation when he didn't need anything in return from them. God who surrendered his own son to death on a cross in order to redeem that same creation after it had fallen. In short, God gets hospitality and he wants us to get it too. You see, God wants each one of us to understand that we don't need to stay outcast or misfit or on the outside anymore. In short, God wants to invite us, all of us, in. Because God is always working to make outsiders into insiders. And then, and then, he wants his followers to take over the inviting. So what happens if we somehow get it. What happens if we recognize that it means going one level past our comfort zone to share God's gracious invitation? What happens if it means sharing our story with a family member who has been burned by church in the past? What happens if it means sharing that same conversation with some random person, just because they look like maybe they need to hear some good news? And what happens if it means inviting someone who has never been to church or even to a church fellowship function like a barbecue or a dinner or a yard sale and so on? In John chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. What can we tell about heaven from that one verse? What can we tell about this heavenly banquet that is already underway and lasts forever? How about this? First of all, we are all part of God's family. Thus, we are all first place finishers. Second, there is plenty of room and we never have to worry about overcrowding or not having enough. Third, there is familiarity and hospitality for all of Jesus' followers. And that being invited to participate means that there's a front row seat to the eternal festivities for each and every one of us. And fourth, we can all be active, real participants in helping to create it in the here and now. You know, at one time in history, Gentiles were the least and the last and the lost. In other words, the uninvited. 
If you weren't 100% Jewish, that is, one of the chosen people or the covenanted or the invited, then you were very much on the outside looking in. Nevertheless, Jesus of Nazareth made God's salvation an open invitation to everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. To be sure then, God's banquet is open to all of us. However, how we respond to God's generosity says a lot about us. For instance, why is our church, or for that matter, why are so many churches not bringing in new people every week? I mean, how can we say we really get it and, and not be about the business of actively doing something about it through our words and actions, especially we are supposed to invite others? to talk about God, to come to Christian events, and to come to church. I remember once seeing a video wherein a young atheist woman asked, how much do you have to hate people to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? Truly, we can't say we love or even like someone if we're not even bothering to pass on God's gracious invitation. If we're not calling them from the hustle and bustle of the world and the flesh and the devil to come into the banquet. I often wonder what our church would look like if we all were honestly willing to say to others, this is my church and here's why it should be your church too. Would more people be here next week? The simple truth is we need to tell others that the invitation to God's banquet is wide open, that all are welcome to come, and that all they need to do is RSVP. No upgraded wardrobe or green fees required. Let us pray. O Almighty God and Heavenly Father, whose only begotten Son sent his disciples into all the world that they might invite others to the eternal banquet. Teach us to remember that it is not by bread alone that man doth live, but grant that we may feed on him who is the true bread which cometh down from heaven, even Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, to whom with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.